to Living History Project. Today's date is the, uh, December 13, 2003. This is Jane Washburn. I'll be interviewing her. Would you like to tell us a little bit about your background? Thank you. Yes, I certainly would. And you probably wonder how come I was a teacher in Hudson Falls. Yep. I was born on this property here, and my father was born on this property, and my grandfather was four years old when he came here to live. Back in 1890, 1854 they came here. So Washburns have lived here all this time. And how I feel about the wars and the depression are somewhat colored by my family background for generations, if you, you know what I mean. Um, I have seen, I, I was born before the armistice. Therefore, World War I, World War II, Korean War, Vietnam War, pa pa uh, Palestine and Israel, wars in Africa, uh, the Gulf War, and the present two wars have all been part of my life. And I haven't had very many years in my life when there's been total peace in the world. Too bad, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, now, you want to know about uh, the Depression. Mm -hmm. I was a teenager, of course. The big crash came in 1929, and nobody had any, nobody had any money anyway. Um, I went to uh, Southland. Uh, first, I went to a little private school down in Wilton run by an educator, not a teacher, an educator, very fine woman. And then I went to school in South Lens Falls We took the trolley. We had to walk up the road here to the trolley. From there, uh, from South Lens Falls, at the end of the seventh grade, I was sent to the Glens Falls High School because it had a better curriculum. And my parents, neither one of whom had education beyond high school, they wanted it for their three daughters. And so both my older sister, well, all of us graduated from Glens Falls High School. And my family paid tuition for that. Uh, so we didn't have any money, but living on a farm made a difference. We always had plenty of food. Plenty of milk, plenty of eggs, plenty of butter, plenty of meat, lots of vegetables. And if you wonder, um, what might have contributed to the fact that today I'm 86 and still navigating, it might be because I had a long walk every day to get the bus from up here near Moreau State Park to Glens Falls and then back down again at night. We got lots of exercise. We didn't have time for a lot of foolishness. <laughs> we took piano lessons, you know, and all of those things. Uh, my sister graduated two years ahead of me and went to Russell Sage. So when it was time for me to go to college, and I was interested in home economics, Russell Sage was the place. They had a very good home economics department there then. And so I was sent to Russell Sage. And she graduated two years ahead of me. It was Depression days. We each got an allowance of $4 a month. Dollar a week. How would you like that? <laughs> uh, we uh, we didn't have a lot of clothes. Uh, we didn't have cars, um, but we had we had a very good education. And um, I graduated in 1939, and it was right at a time when schools were beginning to centralize. And with centralization, they put in a lot of new departments. Home economics was one. Future prior. Uh, Agriculture courses was another, industrial arts courses, all things like that that were going to be helpful to train people uh, in Depression days, if you know what I mean. So I went out to Western New York to teach, $1,200 a year, and uh, walked into a school that had no home economics department, nothing, but I got it going. And I was there for six or seven years, and I was there during Pearl Harbor. One of the questions you asked was Pearl Harbor. Mm -hmm. I didn't know anything about it until that night. And when I uh, heard, somebody had had the radio on, 
And of course, where was this? This was in Ripley, New York. That's the last town west of New York State, right on the Pennsylvania border. My sister was teaching in Newfield, which was just south of Ithaca. She taught French. I don't know what uh, Somebody always had a radio on. And when they heard a piece of news, they immediately got on the telephone. And then that person got the radio on. And this is how news got around. And that's how I got the news. Somebody had the radio on and heard about Pearl Harbor. And as I told you before, I was indignant because I had been to the movies previous to this and knew that two ambassadors from Japan had come to visit Franklin Roosevelt at the White House the day before this happened. And they never let on that all this was being planned, you see. We all knew that something was going on, but we didn't know what it was. And as I think I told you previously, my roommate's boyfriend joined the Air Force in 1940 summer. And he was a pilot on the B-17s. And he flew to Manila. The plane had all the armaments out that it needed, but it had no ammunition. And uh, he was there when uh, Clark Field was bombed. And the only thing he saved was his camera, which I think is quite interesting. Um, then he had quite a hard time getting out. <clears throat> and it took months to get out of the Philippines, you see. All this time, uh, the war with Europe was going on, too. And here again, if, if you wanted to know something, you had to go to the movies to see the Pathé News, to see about the battles and things that were going on there. There was lots of talk about what Hitler was doing. Nobody really knew the terrible things, only rumors. And out where I was, eventually there was a, a German prisoner of war camp right outside Buffalo. We had rumors of it, but nobody ever saw it. Nobody ever knew. And then when Pearl Harbor came about, all the Japanese people were rounded up. And you've probably seen pictures of that, haven't you? Mm -hmm. That uh, they got um, prisoner of war places for them. Many innocent people were hurt. And uh, people of foreign descent, Suye, who was up here on Mount McGregor, had been there 20 years, Japanese girl. And I, I think she was temporarily relieved of her job as caretaker up there. And then we had German people, we had Austrian people, and we were very suspicious. From now, but, um, it was at, really after Pearl Harbor that things began to tighten up. You couldn't buy an automobile, you couldn't buy tires. Gasoline was rationed. Here on the farm, of course, we were able to get more gasoline because we weren't, we didn't live in town. And uh, we, we also uh, didn't have a lot of uh, farm equipment that took gasoline. In fact, I was a sophomore in college before we got electricity. And one of the biggest things that Franklin D. Roosevelt did as president was to bring about rural electrification. It was a wonderful, wonderful thing to be able to slip a switch and have a light. And um, this is digressing, but my mother and father heard about this, you know, and that so-and-so out such and such a place is getting electricity, and my mother said, why don't we have electricity? And so she called Niagara Mohawk. And the woman she spoke with was a husband Paul's woman by the name of Walling. And she said, if you want electricity, you get all the people in the community together that want it, and I will come and tell them about it. So everybody called everybody, and they all met down there at the farmhouse. They had a big meeting. And one month later, they had electricity. It was just wonderful. Um, now to get back to uh, after Pearl Harbor, we began to have rationing. And uh, sugar was one of the first things to go. Butter was another. We had oleo, which was just the color of Crisco, you know. We had to put little colored things in it to 
cook it up. The meat was terrible, except for spam. Can't eat it even today. And uh, hot dogs you could get. They were the mixtures, you see. Thing. But we had lots of vegetables. We had our own pork. And then now and then we would have a piece of beef. Some of the, we had the dairy farm. So now and then we had beef. Um, then in the town of Ripley, where I was teaching, they got rationing. <clears throat> and the teachers were one group of people. They could always get together to get a job done. So the teachers were responsible for signing all the people in that town up for rationing. And, and you got stamps for gasoline and for butter and for or various foods, canned foods and meat and meat products, you see. And this is beside the point, but we had one famous person in this little town, and um, he was a Civil War veteran, and he was one of the last ones to die. He over a hundred years old when he died, but um, he was um, a vegetarian, and so he and very very um, patriotic. So when rationing came along, that little town, everybody that had any extra stamps for canned vegetables or canned fruits, they gave it to the grocer where Grandpa Rounds did his shopping. But Grandpa Rounds would never, ever give anybody one of his meat stamps because it was unpatriotic. Yet he never knew that everybody in that town was keeping him well fed for their extra stamps. We all know. <laughs> it was rather interesting. We all got along somehow or other on what we had. We had lines that would form. If you were walking along Glen Street and you saw a line, you'd know that Somebody had cigarettes, or they had stockings, or they had candy, or some one little thing, and, that, and you'd get in line whether you wanted it or not, and, and buy the product so you, somebody else did want it couldn't get there, you know. Uh, stockings, it got so well, we couldn't get nylon stockings, and we had to wear rayon stockings, which would, it was weak when it was wet, so you'd get runs in the morning. Or we had to wear cotton stockings, but somehow we managed to do that too. Um, travel was very hard. I sat on my suitcase from west of Buffalo to Albany on the train one day. Now that's a long, it's about six hours. And to sit in the aisle on my suitcase, because there were no, none of seats in the trains, you see. Uh, but somehow or other we all got along and can you tell me more about the train? The train? Well, uh, there would always be men on the train, uh, uh, servicemen on the train. And that was the first time, I think, when uh, gentlemen did not have to give up their seats to a lady. And if you saw a serviceman on, he got to sit. I took a trip in an airplane, and if you got, uh, were changing planes, like in Chicago, and there was a serviceman waiting to get on that train, plane, he got on, you were bumped. And they had priority, which probably was right, because many of them were tired, and many of them um, didn't know where they were going or what the futures were going to be. And I don't know how many we lost, but we lost a lot. Now, did you ever get bumped? Yes, I did. Yes, I did. I, I, it was uh, about 1940s. Five, I went to Galveston, Texas, to see this college roommate of mine who had a new baby. And her husband had come home and was flying out of the air base there. He was a weather expert. And I got bumped every stop from Buffalo, then Detroit, then I think it was Chicago and Kansas City and Dallas, Texas. It took me 24 hours to get there, which now you do in about about 46. And the planes were uh, not big planes like we have today either, of course. Uh, I always was able to get on a bus. You could always get on a train, but you often had to sit in the aisle on the bus or on the train. And um, it was not easy because when I wanted to come home, I always took the train. 
and then my father would meet me up here at the mile walk down. Couldn't do that with a suitcase very well. Uh, now, what else should, would you like to know? Um. There were a lot of recipes, by the way, too, uh, for eggless cakes and butterless cakes and you know, sponge cakes and things like that. It was amazing what women did to give variety to their their foods. Um, were you ever asked to join the workforce for the war? No. You weren't? No. No? no. Never was. What did you think about the teacher shortage? Well, that was very, very difficult. Very difficult. We had a lot of people in and out, in and out. And um, usually they were people that uh, were not successful teachers to begin with. I think we had a lot of um, sort of bad education. And I remember um, at that time the state of New York enacted the law that all students had to take a health course. Well, who was going to teach it? Well, it turned out the home economics teachers got to teach it because we all had a science background. Mm -hmm. And um, we, we were very health conscious. We all had to um, do first aid. And home nursing, we all had to take home nursing courses, or all the women do. And men and women took first aid courses. And you had to learn how to do artificial respiration, and they'd get you down on the floor and then push your chest, and you'd be aching for about two weeks after that. But everybody did that. We rolled bandages. We knitted a lot. And hats and scarves and some did sweaters. We made dop kits, which were little toilet bags and then filled with things, you know. And if you knew somebody was in the service, you made a lot of cookies and sent them goodies, you know. And you tried to write letters and uh, keep, keep going fun. Tell them what's going on here, you know. And of course, you watch the newspaper because it would give a list of all the local people that had been injured or killed. And all, all the towns had these big signs out, you know, of the people in the town that were in it. Now, I don't know where Hudson Falls had theirs, but they must have had one that had a list of all the people that were joining the service. Um, it also changed your social life, for women particularly, because there wasn't anybody to go out with, unless he was 4F and really something wrong with him. You know? And that was the first that <coughs> women felt free to go to a restaurant or to a movie unescorted. Really rather an uncomfortable time, if you weren't used to that, you know. You found that there was an advantage to the war for women? Oh, a lot of women got jobs. There were a lot of women that had always been just stayed home and looked after the children that got out and got jobs and earned money. And, of course, it was Depression times, too. So that extra money was wonderful to come by. And um, they, um, one person would have a car and everybody would pay him or her so much to ride, say, to Glens Falls. One of the places that we had for women was McMullen's a uh, place um, that ma ma made men's shirts originally and then it went into making women's dresses very very fine quality very attractive dresses and the women learned very good sewing techniques by working in the, the shirt factories and the, the dress factory and then a lot of women went to General Electric which wasn't far enough but they couldn't drive back and forth to Schenectady if they would team up, you know, and take turns driving. The G took on a lot of people from this area. And probably, too, where the Imperial Wallpaper was, that was a chemical company. It did make wallpaper, but the chemistry of it was um, important, and that was along on the Hudson there, between Hudson Falls and Glens Falls. Guy, uh, what was his name? Guy Cole? I don't remember, I think the buildings are gone now. Yeah, uh, I think some of them are. Yes, uh, I, I think I mentioned to you on the phone that you wanted to get a look at the Look magazine, Hometown USA. Yeah. Have you had a chance to? 
Oh, no. That you might even find that the library in Hudson, your Hudson Falls library would have a copy of that. Yeah. Um, when the men came back from war, like, how did the women feel when they started taking back their jobs? Well, I don't think the men did. I think that there was a boom on them to, re to produce things. Mm -hmm. We had the materials then to make clothes and make shoes and automobiles. My father kept saying, I didn't have a car, you see, of course. And he said, well, as soon as the war is over, then they'll make cars again. They were, they were not making any. So, of course, when the war was over, I was ready to buy a car. And the price boomed up considerably. My father said, if you'll just wait a year or two, the price will go down. Well, of course, it didn't happen. So it was 1950 before I got my first car, and it was a brand new Pontiac. <laughs> and I paid $1,700 cash for it, because I saved my money. And that was my first car. Some of the first cars that came out were very poorly made and very unsatisfactory, so probably waiting a little bit didn't hurt. But there was a big boom. There was a, also a building boom. There, there were no apartments. There were no houses built. And these young couples, there was, that was the time when girls and young men were getting married, and then there was that baby boom, and there was no place for them. My sister lived down there at the farmhouse for, I think, about two years while her husband was in the service. And when he came home and they began looking for a house, it was really very, very hard. If you knew somebody that died, then you got a hold of the relatives to find out what was going to happen to the house. And then they started making a lot of houses, building a lot of houses, too. Have you ever heard of Levittown? No, I haven't. Never heard of Levittown? No. Never heard of Levittown. It's a very large town, city, now, down on Long Island, because that was near New York City, you see, and they needed houses. And they built hundreds of houses in this area. They were all alike, and they were all small houses, beginner's houses, you see, for these young couples that uh, were getting married and having children. They had to have places. And so the whole town was built. Schools were built. The whole thing. I, uh, I wonder sometimes what's happened to it. Uh, do you know anybody who went to World War II? Yep. We were several went to World War II. Right here in South Queens Falls, we had a family of two brothers. They both were Marine, Marines, and one was in um, Guadalcanal, and the other was in Iwo Jima. And they both came home safely. And uh, they don't talk about it. Th this little project that you got has probably started a lot of people talking. And uh, I have a little magazine here, which I don't know where it is now. It was uh, came from Tri-State College out in Michigan. And they had a little article in it about three men who had been in the war. and. They were just beginning to talk about it now. So you're going to find out maybe a lot of things that people have kept kind of yeah. in the background. You've heard of them. Yes, some probably weird stories mm -hmm. sometimes. It, it was not easy. My sister was in the Navy, my younger sister, mm -hmm. joined uh, the Waves. And she was down in Norfolk, Virginia, and some of the boats that came in had a lot of burn, burn patients. I remember her saying that. She doesn't ever talk about either what she saw. Of course, she wasn't sent out of the country either. Mm -hmm. But uh, she saw the men when they came home in the condition that they were in. What did you think of the air raid trails? Oh! <laughs> <laughs> they were a big pain in the neck. <laughs> Can you candid explain opinion. them? Big one. Could you explain them? Yes. Um, in your high school today was one of the places of the air raid drills. And you hear this clang, you know, and everybody would get up and... Um, each homeroom had an assigned place, as I remember it. It wasn't your class that you were in, it was your homeroom. 
you had an assigned place to be. It was all along the corridors, and it was inside the stage, all up against the wall. And you stood face to the wall and waited. And so uh, you were protected by the walls, you see, rather than be in the corridor. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't remember if we had to get on our hands and knees or not. I don't think we did, but we had to stand there until it was all over. It was like a fire drill in a way, but the rules were a little different. Some people had um, air raid shelters too, you know, and they stockpiled canned food and sugar and milk, dry milk, and so that if we had a bombing, they would be protected. It was a very big fear, a very, very big fear that we would have Russia would bomb us. We lived with that. We had a family in Hudson Falls. Lived over on the road to Hartford, German family. I won't say the name because I might have the wrong name. But I remember the father's brother came over from Germany and they had been in the war over there. And they had been deprived, of course. And I seem to remember another young man who had been taken prisoner. He was uh, in the Air Force and he'd come down and gotten into some German area, you know, and, and taken prisoner there, but got out of it eventually. We were all glad when it was finally over. Now, you told me about, like, the first aid you had to learn. Can you tell me about that? About first aid? Yeah. Well, we had to learn how to bandage. We had to learn what we should use for certain uh, problems. Uh, mostly bleeding would be the main thing. Um, and how to uh, put a splint on if you had a broken limb. Uh, artificial respiration for drownings, you see. Um, and how to uh, protect against smoke inhalation and fires. And um, I, I guess that was about it. Now, uh, in England, of course, they had terrible air, dr air, air dr drills, and the lots of uh, their their um, their families were lost. I know of one young man who ended up in Bermuda, and he lost his whole family, mother and sisters and all of them. You see, the whole town was, would be wiped out. The bombings were so terrible in parts of London, parts of England. Um, Can you tell me more about rationing? You what, told me some stories oh, about your mom hoarding things. Oh, my mother, my mother, when it began, we knew we were going to have sugar rationing. My mother stored sugar. Now, my mother canned a lot. She canned peaches and um, pears, and she made jellies. And we needed sugar for those things, you know. And so she, we had these great big tin cans that I guess originally potato chips had come in. They were probably 10 gallons or so, like those pails, only they were metal. And she would get sugar and put it up in the attic so that when the necessity arose, why we would get sugar. And we never did really run out of sugar, but we were very careful. Soap was another thing, very hard to come by. And uh, you'd be very careful with your soap. And of course, we didn't have laundromats. And we didn't have um, automatic washing machines either. So that, that, uh, you had to wash by the old fashioned washers with a spin dryer on them. You had a modern one, it had a spin dryer. And you'd put them in this one and wash them, and then you'd take them out and put them in this one and spin them out. And then you could put them in a tub of water to rinse them, you know, and then put them in the spinner to get the water out again so they dry faster. Mm -hmm. But no dryers either. Those were all came after the war. Um, now you're saying earlier about like the quickie marriages. Were well, you many. Ever married? No, I wasn't. No, I wasn't. No. no. Could you tell me about the quickie marriages? No. How you felt about them? Uh, there were a lot. There were a lot of quickie marriages. They the boys would come home uh, for a furlough and know they were going back and felt if I don't get married and get this woman pregnant, I'll have no offspring to carry on my name. 
and there were a lot of marriages of that sort. And then, of course, when the war was over, the marriage was no good. They just didn't get along, and it started this terrible time with lots and lots of divorces and separations. And um, there were a lot of girls that settled for anybody that came along, because it was a time when every girl was supposed to get married and settle down and have a family and keep house. That was the main objective. Uh, in many families, that, that all the daughters should get married, keep house, have children. And then when the war came along and so many thousands of our men were lost, there were not maybe available men of the quality that a girl would like, ed educa good education or intelligence. And so they married whatever came along, and that didn't make for a happy marriage either when the war was over because they didn't have anything in common. I will say, too, that there was an awful lot of drinking that went on. Terrible. Not only during the war, but after the war. These men that came home, they wanted to party and live it up. And there was a lot of drinking that went on. And I think about that, and I think, how did anybody ever survive? Because we didn't have laws about not drinking and driving. Cars were not as safe, supposedly, as they are now. Roads were not as well kept as they were, but yet, and there were a lot of people that were killed too, but almost not as bad as they are now. Well, of course, they didn't have the speed that we have today, but there, there was a lot of drinking that went on, which is very regrettable for both men and women. Did you know of any conscientious objectors? I can't think of any. Can't? What's your religion? I'm a Presbyterian. Didn't the war change your beliefs in any way? Or? Actually, during the war I was a Methodist. <laughs> really? Yes, I was. Why did you convert? Well, I don't know if I should tell this on camera, but I will tell you. Uh, after my father died, <clears throat> I would rent a place in Hudson Falls and stay over there in the winter. My mother went to Florida so that there wouldn't be this driving back and forth. And there were people in Hudson Falls that would go to Florida, love to have their house taken care of for the winter. And so that's what I did. So as long as I was a Methodist when I went there, I went to the Methodist church in Hudson Falls. Where do you girls go to church? No, I'm, what am I I'm talking Catholic. about? You're both Catholic. Mm -hmm. Love that church, beautiful church. Anyway, I went to the Methodist church. It was not friendly. I would go in and nobody would say hello. There was one girl that I had in school, and she would come sometimes and sit with me. I would go out in the morning and say good morning to the minister. He would say good morning. Never said, who are you? Have I seen you before? Did you come last year? And uh, I won't mention names, but uh, there was a, a girl who was Hudson Paul's girl, and she was a teacher in school, and she said to me one day, come on and go to church with me. We've got the most wonderful interim minister. They were looking for a new minister after Mr. LaRue died, who had been there for 20-some, 30-some years. She said he's a professor from RPI, and he really is good. So I went with her. Great. He was a really good, he had a real message. So I went the next week, and somebody came up to me. Now, one of the philosophies of that church is, if you see somebody there that is a visitor, speak to them. Be friendly to them. Somebody came up and said, Ms. Washington, we're so glad you came today. Uh, we're having a some kind of a church supper, and we'd love to have you come. And this was the way it was from the very start. We're so glad you came. We're so glad to have you with us. And I was glad to be there because I was getting a good message and there were friendly people there that way today. So the war didn't make you convert? No, the war had nothing to do with okay. it. No, it was the message I got and the service that I got, the yeah. type of service that I got. It, they... Uh, their, their sermons 
are based on the scripture. It will either be the Old Testament or the New Testament. Now, that's one of the big differences between Protestantism and Catholicism. Your religion is based on the New Testament, right? Mm -hmm. And you probably don't know much about the Old Testament. No. Um, what was the milk strike about? What was that? The milk strike? You told me about oh, the milk Oh, my strike. father, yeah. There were milk strikes for the price of milk was just terrible, just terrible. And farmers wanted more pay for their milk, and so they all went on strike. And they called people who continued to sell their milk, you know, they called them scabs. And the uh, farmers would take their milk. The milk plant was over here in Gansford, right near where the post office in Gansford is now. And uh, a, lot of, a lot of men dumped their milk. But of course, before all this dairy farming had come in, and it was small dairy farms, early on in my father's life, they made butter. My grandmother made butter, I can remember it very well. She had butter customers in Glens Falls. Um, so my father just got out the old churn and made butter. And we had plenty of butter. And uh, the, the war finally got over, the milk war finally got over, and they raised the price. And even today they threatened to have the milk wars, you know, because yeah. the price is down. Um, you, you once told me about the rubber rationing. Can you tell me about that? <laughs> <laughs> oh, all rubber things. Yeah, you couldn't, you couldn't buy a pair of overshoes, you know, and were made of rubber. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of, oh, this is pushing me on here, this one probably. Uh, you know, your underpants have elastic around, they did away with that. You had, they were stitched around and they were buttoned on the side. And I had a college friend, she was very proper Bostonian, and she was walking down the street one day and the button fell off her on her hands. And she said, I just, she was in the middle of the street, she said, I just stood there a minute and let them drop down and reached down and picked them up. And out. <laughs> but the babies, you see, babies had always had rubber pants. No rubber pants. They were not to be had. And uh, so we knit soakers, and they were three corner pieces of wool yarn, because wool holds the moisture, and wool keeps you warm. Our bathing suits were all wool then, because you could get out of the water and you wouldn't feel cold. But then they stopped all that, you know, when you got swimming pools, because lint has, wool has lint, and it would clog up the swimming pools. So now you don't have wool. Very rarely would you find wool bathing suits. But uh, yes, it was very hard on the mothers. There were no pampers and things of that sort. You know. mm -hmm. so it was, the rubber problem was really very bad. Uh, this sounds unbelievable, but when you went to buy a tube of toothpaste, it was in aluminum tubes. You had to take that back to get a new tube because the aluminum then would be converted for a war effort. You gave in your old pots and pans that had holes in them. If they were aluminum, they would be all uh, reprocessed for that. The rubber was needed for um, jeeps and trucks that were part of the war effort, airplane tires and so on, you see. Everything was converted to the war effort that was possible to do. Is there anything that you missed during the war? That I missed? Well, we were very careful about coffee. You didn't waste coffee. But we always had some, but we, you, we drank a lot more tea, probably, uh, which wasn't so scarce. Uh, well, of course, I grumbled about things like soap and nice smelling soap, nice things like that. Um, but we also had very nice French perfumes, which you don't get much of today. Mm -hmm. Some reason or other, but we did have both things. So I don't know if there was too much I missed. Our clothes, the skirts were very short. They actually the government regulated the width of the waistbands and belts 
and the fullness of the skirts, saving on material, you see. And the quality of the material was often rather shoddy, too. When we all wore hats, hats were very fashionable, and, and a good hat would be made out of a, a fur product with wool. Cheap hats were made just of wool. And then they began putting other products in, you know. And another thing, our underwear was silk. We wore Barbizon slips, which were silk, satin. Uh, they had to be ironed, too. But they were nice. And our stockings were silk. Nylon stockings didn't come in until about 1940. About 1940. That was one of the big graduation gifts girls got when they graduated in high school with a pair of nylon stockings. And uh, they had seams in the back, you know. And uh, you had to be very careful that your seams were straight. Never a twisted stocking. And uh, it was, we rolled our stockings because with silk you could roll them. And of course girls got this habit of always pulling up their stockings, you know. Well then when nylon came through you couldn't you couldn't <coughs> roll stockings because they wouldn't stay up. So that's when the two-way stretch came in. And uh, that had its problems, too. I, I, I think back now, and I think probably the happiest moment in my day when I was teaching school was when I could get home and get the girdle off. Now girls don't wear things like that, you think. Were you dated during the war? Well, yes, I was going with a fellow who was a metallurgist. <coughs> And I really didn't think too much about it at the time. But he didn't go to war. And I know now it was because he was a metallurgist with the American Steel Wire in, in the war effort. But he didn't talk about it. Now, why did you choose not to marry while everybody else was marrying? Well, I didn't see anybody I thought I wanted to spend the rest of my life with. There wasn't too much to choose from. Did anybody try pushing you into it? No, well, I had my chances, but I'm glad I didn't take them. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh... So you don't regret it? No. No? No. No. Uh, I think a lot of women... I, I wouldn't... I would say maybe my sister. There was a young man that was in the town that I was teaching in, and. And I introduced him to my sister, and she married him. And she has five wonderful children. But intellectually, they weren't on the same channel. And I think my sister didn't get to do the things that she could have done if she hadn't been so busy raising a big family. But her children all did well. and. Uh, that's a, to their credit, certainly. Mm -hmm. uh, she was bound by having to go back and live in a little small town, and I don't think I would have been happy doing that. I was a great traveler when I was teaching, and I wouldn't trade that for anything. And as one of my friends said, she had married, and uh, she had no children. She said, and I'm not going to have any children. She said, you know how it is. They come to visit you, and when you're tired of them, you can send them home. And uh, that had advantages, too, you know. <laughs> but they, the children were all very close, because this was the farm place here. They came, they came, they came, they came, and they're still coming. This last Thanksgiving, I had a nephew and his wife who had been here, born here, now living in Tucson, and his son, who is a golfer in Atlanta, they were all here for Thanksgiving, and uh, it was great. He married, my nephew was in the Air Force, he flew the A-10s, so he was in the Vietnam War, and he went to Korea, and he went to Alaska, and his wife probably rarely saw him leave in the morning without wondering if he would come home. Now, I'm sure you heard stories back at home about, like, things that were going on across the sea in Europe. Did it affect your life in any way? I don't think so. We did not hear a lot. What was in the paper, 
what was on the radio, Lowell Thomas was on every night, you know, like Dan Rather is on now. And they would tell stories. And then if you wanted to really see it, you went to the movies. And the Pathé News came on, it would show the ships that were being burned and the soldiers that were marching and the tanks that were down in the mud and all of those things. That's the only way you got any pictures of anything. Except Life Magazine would come out with pictures every week, what would Picture Magazine? They were, they would show pictures. That's why it was so popular. But um, we all talked about all of these things and shared whatever we heard from... Could you tell some of the stories you, if you remember any that you heard? can't think of any off the top of my head. I had one friend whose husband uh, was a flyer, and he flew the hump. And he wrote her long letters about this trip. The hump was uh, into China, you know. Himalaya. Mm -hmm. Himalaya. Mm -hmm. I guess so. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, was a, it was a scary thing. And he used to write these letters to her. She was a, a commercial teacher, and so she taught typing. So she would type them off and mimeograph them off and they sent them to her friends. And they were very interesting to read, and I kept them around for years, and then thought, this is wrong, they should go back to her children, because um, they should know what their father been doing, you know. So I, I wished I had had some of these things, but I don't, because I sent them back to the families. Uh, I've heard my brother-in-law tell, he was on an LST, that uh, here we were, we never saw a nice ham on the market or a beef steak on the market. And uh, they had so much of this food on his ship that sometimes it would go bad and they'd have to dump it overseas, over into the water, you know, and get rid of this it. This was your brother? Brother-in-law. Brother-in-law. Mm -hmm. And that my sister came here to live with my mother and father and her well, she had one child, and then the second child was born here in the Lens Hospital. So he, they were here all the time he was in the service. So you had two other sisters? One other sister, a younger sister, who joined the waves. And so she wasn't home much of the time. So it was just you and your sister growing up on the farm? Well, and well, the younger sister, she was seven years younger than I. But the older sister was only a year and a half older, so... We walked many miles together. We went to school together. We walked to the bus. It was, um, when the trolley went out, we had to go up to Old Route 9. That's the road by the Moreau um, State, State Park up there. You know where it is. Well, I had to walk up to that corner, which was a good mile and a half to two miles, and get the bus, which took us to the Glens Falls High School. That was, instead of, waiting downtown to turn around. They took all this. There were boys and girls that came over from Spire Falls, came over Spire Falls Mountain to get to school. It was really not an easy test. There were no school buses. There was no school lunch. You all took a paper bag lunch. And then um, lots of times, if it was a nice day like today, we would walk downtown, down to Woolworths and Kresge. Oh, that's one I lights, no matter, sunshine did that. Um, we would walk uh, down there and back, and then we'd walk down at night and get the bus and walk on here. I would leave the house about quarter after seven in the morning, and the bus would come along about ten minutes of eight, and school started at 8.30, with an hour off for lunch, and out at 3.30. How does that compare with yours? Let's get up. How many minutes do you get for lunch? Um, we get like 35 minutes. Oh dear, when I was there, it was only 26. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh... Yes, they have a lot more people now in our school. <laughs> yes, but your cafeteria is probably bigger. We had two cafeterias then. Were you still? Yeah, we still have two cafeterias. Um, I understand that the office is on the main corridor now. And, uh... In uh, in between B and C wing, is it? Yeah. That was, that's where <coughs> my, my rooms were then. Really? The office was on the other side of, by the parking lot. Teachers were not allowed to park in the front parking lot because everybody in the office had to watch to see who was sneaking out early, the kids, you know. 
sneak out early. Mm -hmm. So that they parked in the front lot, we parked in the back lot. <laughs> I don't know what they do today. Um, do you remember any other stories? Oh, I don't know. Uh, there were things I thought about. Uh, I have a couple of questions mm -hmm. that I wish somebody would answer for me. One is, what were the results of the bombing of Hiroshima? One of the big fears was that people would become sterile from the results of the bomb. I want to know, did they? Did what? Become sterile. Now, uh, we know Japan certainly has a big population boom. But yeah. was the population affected by the bomb? It was. Uh, yeah, <coughs> people were affected by the bomb. But I'm not sure if people were, it became sterile from that it. That was what was a great word. Were they? I don't know. Cancer. No. Uh, people got cancer and things like that, I know. But I'm not sure if they became sterile from it. Well, I, that's one of my wonders. Mm -hmm. And I have another wonder about Adolf Hitler. Adolf Hitler was going to create the master race. Mm -hmm. So he went about it very scientifically. He had camps for girls which were located by the men's army camps. And children were literally bred the finest of the German youth. Now, if a child was born with a hearing problem or mongoloid or poor eyesight or some other thing they were destroyed and but these young women had these perfectly beautiful babies and life magazine had a picture of them years and years ago they were a year year and a half old beautiful children i want to know what happened to them have you ever heard no, I haven't. Have you? Have I've you, never even heard about Have you camps. ever heard of anybody who came forward and said, I was one of those children? No. What's happened to them? I don't know. <laughs> i never even heard of the camp. Well, they had them all over Germany. He was going to produce a master race. The I'll brightest. look into that for you. I would love to know. I asked Sarah. Do you know Sarah Pettis? Yeah. She lives right there across the road. Uh, I asked her, she said she was going to look it up on the internet, but I don't know. Yeah, I'll look it up on the internet for you. Where are those people? Uh, wouldn't you like to know if they are mm -hmm. outstanding and if they are more healthy? Or they produce more healthy yeah, children? Or if they're brighter? Or yeah. if they're more attractive? Mm -hmm. I, I think it's so interesting that nobody has ever... Maybe they have, but... Well, uh, people aren't really interested you know, in that. some of these people, they have to make big, big news out of everything. Mm -hmm. Don't know. Um, let me see, were there any other questions that I had in my mind? Oh, I wanted to tell you that there's a book that's going to come out mm -hmm. in June of 2005. And the book is called Dumb But Lucky. And the man who's writing it is Dr. Curtis, Dick Curtis. His son married my niece. Anyway, he was a college professor, but at 19 years old, he flew a P-51 Mustang, which was a fighter pilot, fighter plane. And he proceeded the bombers over Italy and Germany and parts of So that's how he says he was dumb but lucky. And he kept a diary. So it's being published by Random House. But it won't be out till June of 205. So okay. you'll be in college then? Yeah. And you can... I'll be in my second year of uh, Maybe look for that. Mm -hmm. See, there's mm -hmm. quite a lot being written today. Uh, another, another book, if you'd like, uh, like to read, is to read Michener's book called Caravans. You ever heard of that book? No. Well, there's a program on TV called C-SPAN 2, and it's on every Saturday and Sunday. You know it. You watch it, do you? No, but I've heard of it. <coughs> and it is a book reviews of nonfiction books. It covers a vast lot of things. A lot of history is covered. A lot has been done about Franklin and Washington and some of those things. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, they are 
coming through with stuff about Afghanistan and Pakistan and Iraq and all of these. And one author said, if you want to understand Afghanistan today, read Michener's Caravan. So I got it and I read it. And when you think that that culture predates Jesus Christ, and in many ways they are not very different today, plus that they are hampered by mountains and deserts, and it's lots of little tribal communities, you see. It's a terrible existence, very hard existence, and the people are very violent. Uh, was there anything else I wanted to mention here? As I thought about things, um, oh, at Christmas time, I think this must have been about Christmas of 1939, probably, the radio had a program where the children, the British children, who had been sent to the United States for safekeeping, could call, could talk to their parents on the radio. And it was just, it was just the most heart-wrenching experience. You hear these children, seven and eight years old, you know, talking to their parents over there, but they had been sent here to be safe, you see, from the bombing. Mm -hmm. There were a lot of children over here. Uh, and we sent a lot of care packages, too, at Christmas time. Even though you didn't know the boys, you know, you'd collect them. And Red Cross did a lot of uh, getting people to do those. And Red Cross was very, very active in all the communities getting people involved. In we also had airplane watch, you know, mm -hmm. up on top of the school, where every airplane that went over, you reported it. Mm -hmm. and they kept track of things. Of course, along the coast, there were submarines and all kinds of things that people had to watch for. Now, did your sisters help contribute to the war effort, or? Don't remember, don't remember that they did. The younger one was, in school, and then she went in the waves. The older one was involved with her family, and she was a great knitter, but I don't think she ever did anything for the war. Mm -hmm. um, I guess that was about it. We went to the movies a lot. It was cheap, and you, you really got a good, you got a feature movie. And uh, you got the previews, and you got the news, the Pathé news. Was this all about the war, the news, or...? Yeah. Basically, yeah. Oh, about some of the movie actors and actresses, too, and what they were doing, because that was something we were very interested in. Yeah. Um, I watch, once in a while, when those old movies come on, I <laughs> just think they're terrible. There's a lot of cigarette smoking, for one thing. And uh, all black and white. Mm -hmm. But um, we, we went to the movies a lot. It was, what else was there? I mean, there wasn't, there wasn't, uh, everything was kind of closed down, you know. You couldn't go any place because you didn't have a car. <laughs> Quite different from today. Yeah. You know, kids both put both drive cars. You can go all over. Parking lots full of your cars. Do you like to stop and think of anything else? Well, I, if you have any questions, I'll try to answer them. I don't have any more questions. Well, then maybe that's we're running into a dry spell. Okay. <laughs> I don't even don't. These were something. Uh, what did you think about President Roosevelt when he died? We all knew he wasn't well. I Me, mean, you couldn't look at him. We knew he wasn't well. I I was a Republican, and I know I made a mistake in feeling that he'd been in too long. He was in for 16 years. And previous to that, he was governor of New York State, so he was in the limelight for a long, long while. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was, a, there was a slogan, you can't change horses in the middle of the street, which meant you can't change presidents while the war is on. And that was one of the reasons he was put in year after year, was to maintain 
his position to to uh, knowledgeably be able to help us with the war. He probably was the best equipped that we had. And he wasn't afraid of Stalin, and he wasn't afraid of um, whoever the Prime Minister of England was. Oh, he and Winnie Churchill were great friends, you know. And uh, But then as he got older, he was less and less able to get out and get around. And uh, they only showed us what they wanted us to see. They didn't want us to know that he was in such bad health, poor health. Was probably the smart. And Harry Truman was an entirely different kind of man. Roosevelt was a very highly educated man and spoke very beautiful English. You know, Harry Truman was a, or just an ordinary man who had worked in a men's clothing store and sold suits and hats and things. You know. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how come he ever got into politics the way he did, but he had a sign on his desk that said, the buck stops here, and by golly, nobody could talk him into spending money that he didn't feel was right. He was actually a very good president. And now, uh, when you think about June 6, 1944, What did I think about what? June 6, 1944, D-Day. D-Day. Uh, the most jubilation, and we got the day off. Got the rest of the week off. So I remember. We were very happy. We knew it was coming. We did not know about Normandy until it happened. You see, that was very, very great secret. Um, we d we did not know. We we figured that something big was going to happen, but we didn't know when exactly. Yeah. Do you think the invasion of Omaha Beach was necessary? Yes, I do. Yeah, I do. do. Mm -hmm. And it was a terrible thing, a lot of the fellows. In fact, I took a, to do all this embroidery, I took classes at Elsa Williams School in Massachusetts. Several years, I read, after I retired. And one time there was a man there, and his wife had been interested in embroidery, and he, went with her and he became interested. He had only one arm and he had been in the battle three hours and lost his arm. And he had taken it up and, and he he did very, very nice work with one hand, but uh, he was maimed for life as he because it was way up here at the shoulder. Do you know how he felt about it? No, he never didn't talk about that. He mm -hmm. just said three hours, and his arm was gone. And that's a, it was a very violent thing, mm -hmm. very violent. Sure was. Mm -hmm. These men keep going back, you know. Like the, the Marines, they have meetings every year. Um, and then they go back to some of these places and see what has happened, you know. And, uh, It's, uh, it was a terrible thing. So many of them were so young. Yeah. Not much older than you are, you see. Yeah, we know. And, uh, well, I don't know. You probably got young men go that you know of going into yeah. war now, do you? Mm-hmm. What did you think about the draft? The draft? Mm-hmm. Well, I think at the time of, of, uh, of the World War II, it was very essential. <coughs> and, uh, there's a lot of people that would not have gone into it if they hadn't been drafted. It was, it was getting down to the point where they were going to draft men as old as 38, you know, which seemed pretty old, but that's how hard up we were. And uh, but all the young ones got out of, as soon as they got out of high school, they joined up. And I remember one boy in particular we were very fond of. He wasn't over there very long and he was killed, and he was probably 19. A lot of them very, very young, you know, they were lost. Mothers had little uh, things they hung in the window, you know, uh, a little red, white, and blue sign, and it had stars on it. And when you had one son in, you had one star, two sons, two stars, and so on. Then if you lost a son, <coughs> you had a gold star. 
and you could go by the houses and see these and you know where there were men in the service and who had lost sons. And of course this area lost some too. Now I heard that he, some of these men they went to Canada to escape the draft. Well that was uh, that was not World War Two. No it wasn't? No. Or, were they eager? To no, I don't, no I don't think they were eager. But uh, <coughs> I think the draft was very efficient. I mean, <coughs> they couldn't catch them. I mean, they would catch them. Uh, there wasn't the, there wasn't the it was the Vietnam War where the men went to Canada, and uh, there was a draft then too, but it, it was somehow it was not as strict as it was in World War. The feeling was entirely different in World War Two because of the Japanese. We were mad. And my sister, the younger sister, lives down in Georgia, is still mad. And to some degree, I am still indignant. I went to Japan on one of my trips. Beautiful country. Friendly people. Clean, very clean. But I didn't trust them. And I'm not sure whether I do today. I don't know. Did you hear about all men enlisting early in the Army when they got the draft notice? Well, many of them enlisted before they got the draft notice, yeah. and therefore they were able to select if they wanted to go in the Navy or if they wanted to yeah. go in the Air Force and so on. Now, the Air Force was actually part of the Army at that time. It was the Army Air Force. It was a different division of the Army. It's only the Army, the Navy, and the Marines. Mm -hmm. Marines were a tough bunch, and you had to be ready to do all kinds of things to join the Marines. They were tough, and a lot of them were sent to the Japan war. What do you think about the bombings on Japan? I, I think probably it was the only way to get things done. It was just going on and on and on. And it ended things in a hurry. And we'd spent a lot of time getting it ready. I know of a uh, knew of a young woman who worked at Oak Ridge. She didn't know what she was working on. And uh, e so even the people that were making the parts of the atomic bomb didn't know about it. Have you ever seen the movie The Enola Gay? No. Haven't. No. You tell your teacher to get that show to you. <laughs> okay. Do you know what the Enola Gay was? No. No? You don't? The Enola Gay was the airplane that carried the crew that dropped the atomic bomb. And it was named for the mother of one of the men on that plane. It's a wonderful, wonderful short movie. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was very, very, very secret. You've also known about Amelia Earhart. Mm -hmm. and she was lost. She and she was probably doing secret work for the government too. The Enola Gay is an exciting movie to see. I'll be sure to tell our teachers that. Yeah, I know about that. You probably could pick it up, couldn't you? With the, mm -hmm. I, I, it's been on TV years ago, but it it's a good movie, and uh, it's true facts. There was a lot of secret stuff that went on, very very quietly. Part of it probably because we didn't have television, because you know we've got people over in uh, Iraq right now. Well, you probably watched it. That, sat right there in the truck with them while they were going down towards Baghdad. Didn't you watch that? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Couldn't do it back then. So it was quite different. I have a nephew, grandnephew, probably shouldn't tell all my family tales. He was in the Gulf War. And he was, uh, he'd been in England for two or three years, in the Air Force. Uh, he was in, um, security work. And uh, he was sent from England to 
Saudi Arabia. And he got there, I guess it was Riyadh, Christmas Eve. And he said, we got off the plane and there was somebody meeting us with a shovel and said, here, take this, get busy, and start shoveling and fill those sandbags. They were building up these berms, you know, all around. Got off the plate and did that. But he also got a chance to see Bob Hope, who came in, you know. And so he was there all during a lot of the, of the war. And uh, he doesn't tell a lot about it, but it's a, the, the interesting thing is that he now is a security man for Prince Bandar, who is the ambassador from Saudi Arabia down in Washington. And I think part of his success probably is that he had this experience over there and he knew what the people were like and so, you know, women don't drive, for example. They have to be driven every place. Did you find that the soldiers, when they returned from World War II, were they very secretive about what happened? Oh, yeah, I don't know anything about it. No. They no? No, they wouldn't tell anything. They wouldn't say anything to anybody? Well, also, if you were polite, you wouldn't ask. Mm-hmm. You didn't try to dig it out of them. Mm-hmm. I think even their parents didn't know. And Vietnam was the worst. I've heard of cases where some of the men still have nightmares. And it probably made a lot of them violent too, you know. That was, that was a terrible thing. Anything else you can think of? No. Well, Did you, do you have any questions for me? Or? Well, what, what happened to those, those beautiful babies? <laughs> okay. I want to know that. Um, no, uh, I was, I went in, I was in Europe, my first trip uh, was in 1957, which wasn't very long after the war, and the uh, feeling was still very high. I, we had, when we were in Germany, we had a young man who was guiding our group, and, uh, and his father had been in the war. So. so, what do you think about the world, the war today? The Afghan, uh, Iraq war? Yeah. I feel we had to do it for mm -hmm. the safety of the world. I feel indignant that France and Germany won't help. After all, who were the troops that went marching into Paris when the World War II was over? Mm -hmm. And who, were the, who was it that helped to get that Berlin Wall down? And how much money did we put into all of this? And now this, this, this terrorism is a worldwide thing, and it has to be stopped. I do feel, as many people do, that the men that, or the people that were planning this, because there are women in it too, didn't plan far enough as to what to do once the battle was over. And it's been an unexpected uh, situation where we've been, we've lost many men and we've been badly hurt by it. Because that, their way of life is entirely different from ours. And I don't think we understood it. Also, we're not always right. Americans are not always right. And um, people don't like us because we may appear to be cocky and, and superior. And we're not always right. So you think the war today is necessary? I do. I feel it's very necessary. Also, I think uh, people don't understand Americans. Who are Americans? Well, I'm one of the few people, I think, living anymore that's Strictly British, Scotch, long-standing American citizens. There's no French in there, there's no German in there, there's no Hispanics in there, there's no blacks in there. It's all uh, Anglo-Saxon. Well, thanks for letting me interview you. Well, I was, if it's any help to you, 
I'm happy to do it. I want to say this too. When I was young, my grandfather would tell me stories. Mm -hmm. I didn't listen very well. Now I wish I had. <laughs> and my grandma too. Didn't listen. So you're saying that people should start listening to the older generation? How are we going to keep these things? Don't you agree? Yeah. And, and they're very precious, really. Uh, the little things that I think about my grandparents, the little sayings that I, they have. I have a book out there in, the, in my desk. Well, Would you want to pause this and we can look at it? Oh, okay. Well, and if you, mm -hmm. this is not it. Where is it? And I had the wrong book. It is dated 1776. His name was Jamil Garlinghouse. Can I come up closer? <laughs> Can you imagine trying to read the, out of this? But I'd like to turn it off. Okay.